Hello, everybody, and welcome to a town hall on the financial information system implementation, co-hosted by the Academic Senate and UCSD administration. My name is Stephen Constable, and I am the chair of the San Diego division of the Academic Senate. If you've registered for this town hall, I don't have to tell you that the enterprise systems renewal process has been the most frustrating exercise, and the Oracle financial system in particular has failed to deliver the information we need on a daily basis to manage our contracts and grants. The Academic Senate has been in discussions with the administration throughout this process, trying to understand what went wrong, how it can be fixed, and when will it be fixed. At one of our recent meetings, we decided a town hall on this subject would be useful. Now, I expect you've had your fill of town halls during this pandemic, but faculty desperately want answers, and it became clear that communication on this issue could be improved. So here we are, another town hall. I want to thank Karen Agama, who was chair of the Senate Committee on Planning and Budget when Oracle first rolled out at UCSD, for helping organize this town hall and acting as today's moderator. I would now like to hand the virtual podium over to our CFO, uh, Pierre Ouye, to in continue introductions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Constable. And uh, I wanted to recognize how difficult uh, this transition has been and continues to be for both faculty and staff. Uh, if I think of the last year, we had to manage four major implementations. Uh, UC Path, uh, we are supposed to go live in 2019, but we got delayed by uh, OP to 2020. The new chart of account, um, which is essentially a common language that uh, is mandated by UC so that we can speak the same accounting language across uh, the system. Um, and on the campus side, two major initiatives, um, Oracle Financial, of course, and a new procurement system. And both of them were needed because uh, all systems were failing, and we can come back to that. Had everything gone smoothly, uh, it would have been a very significant amount of work. And of course, not everything uh, went smoothly. Um, we continue to experience uh, significant service issues with uh, the PATH uh, Center, which have uh, significant downstream implications. And of course, we have experienced significant issues with respect to financial reporting, which is critical, of course, to our uh, research enterprise. So in this context, we thought that uh, it was important to regroup today and have a very candid town hall. Um, and I'm grateful for the Senate leadership and uh, Stephen Carey in particular for hosting and for moderating. And I'm also grateful to my colleagues uh, here for being on the panel. So joining me today uh, will be uh, Vince Kellen, uh, Chief Information Officer. Uh, Kevin Shaw, uh, UC San Diego alumnus, who has been managing the entire ESR program. Uh, Shaw Ross, uh, uh, controller. She's also the financial officer for health sciences, so she's very close to it. And uh, I want to tell you that uh, they all have been working 24-7 for the last year, including their teams, with a single purpose, which is to support our academic enterprise. So um, despite uh, all the, the challenges I wanted to uh, publicly um, celebrate and, and, and thank them for that. Um, they will cover three major themes today. Uh, number one is a very candid recognition of uh, all the implementation shortfalls. Uh, I think it's important to uh, do that to uh, level set. Um, number two is a review of everything that has been done to address uh, these issues to date. Uh, number three is what we are still working on uh, to get us to where we need to be. And then we'll very quickly move to the Q&A session, which I think, uh, in my experience, is the most valuable part of these town halls. So I hope that sets the context, and I will turn it over to uh, our controller, Charles Ross. Uh, Charles. Thank you, Pierre. <clears throat> um, as, as Pierre mentioned, we're going to start off um, uh, with, um, we'll need to move the slide, sorry. I need the next slide, please. Thank you. Well, we need to start off with um, a shortfall. So, you know, where did where did we we fall down here, and, and what happened? The one of the first things that um, has created an issue was the fact that in the Oracle system, which is consistent with their other peer type systems of theirs, there are stricter financial controls than in our legacy system. 
the major one that has caused um, heartache is that the system has a control in it that does not allow expenses to be charged to grants or projects that have expired. Um, now, in our previous system, that was not there and you could keep charging for forever. And unfortunately that led to as many of the faculty experienced um, problems with uh, deficits in, in funds and, and, and that we've been trying to fix those back um, for a number of years now. That, that won't happen under the new system because of the control. However, by having this control in day one, it created a backlog of transactions that required review and correction because not every expenditure that was being charged to an expired grant or project was wrong. Um, there could be just timing delays and other things that would approve it. So now your, your fund managers are, are finding that they have to go and deal with this um, and, and get those to go through if they're correct or uh, find other funding for those obviously that, that truly don't belong there. But that, that's an additional body of work and it does delay the reporting to the faculty because the, we have to get the, fig, the reports accurate. So that is, that is an issue. Um, what could we have done? We could have, um, what we did do, I should say is, is too, is that once we became aware of how onerous this was, we were able to um, put a, a, um, <clears throat> something in there that allowed these charges to um, be, to go through for extra, I can't remember, 90 days or something like that, which helped stop the bleeding, so to speak. But there's still the backlog that occurred in the first few months of the, of the fiscal year that folks are dealing with. So that is a control that is a good control, but by having it right at day one, it did create a backlog, which we had not properly anticipated that level of work. There are key reports that, that, us, that were specifically critical to PI faculty reports um, the two most known are my funds and the expanded budget with index summary. They were not ready at go live. There are many reports that were ready that met various criteria, but these reports, which were key, were it was our miss not to have those uh, timely and those that create, create, have created problems of faculty trying to understand where they stand with their whole portfolio of projects. There'll be more, Kevin will talk a little more about that later because we are getting those prepared. Obviously, for in many ways, the stay-at-home order forced all training, team learning, and support to be online. This training did fall short and was inadequate, really, as a replacement for in-person training and real-time support that traditionally, in learning something new, like a new system and how to do it, we do have online you know, in-person reporting, uh, training, I'm sorry, in-person training, and we as a center have people that will come out to business to departments, business offices and train people you know, live right in their unit. Staff, your staff, my staff are able normally to be able to look to their colleague in the next cubicle when they get stuck for additional support. So all of those things were missing. And so we have fallen short in trying to replace those um, training to get to the same place where we need to be. And also not all recharge facilities are ready to post expenses to grants and projects. And generally they're caught up now, but for the first six months, this caused more problems and workload for department fund managers than anticipated. So if we can move to the next slide. So compounding the challenges for all users was, as mentioned, we have a new chart of accounts, which converted over 90,000 indexes, uh, a new chart of accounts, was is required by uh, by the office of the president. Every campus is converting to that. Um, we needed to convert to it at the same time we were putting in these new systems. The old kind of chart of accounts that we had would not have worked with a modern system, but that's a lot of relearning in a short period of time. We had, as Pierre mentioned, multiple system changes at the same time. UC Path, which had been delayed numerous times was not under our control the timing. And unfortunately, due to continued delays, it wound up backing up right into the timing when we were ready to do um, the other system implementations, which didn't allow us time to figure out the quirks that were in there um, it, before we did the other. Um, just as an aside, UC Path has been out in some campuses for a couple of years and they still haven't figured out all the quirks. So I don't know um, 
how much it would have helped if we'd had that piece of time, but it certainly would be a little clearer for a backlog of work. Obviously, Oracle and SAP Concur uh, were two new systems. Uh, the two systems else also came up at the same time. So that's an enormous amount of work to happen uh, simultaneously. We also had data problems. We had recharge transactions that we're not posting or posting incorrectly. The stricter financial controls I already mentioned, and there are other transitional issues. And of course, the inadequate training that we problem that I referred to, tools that weren't didn't meet all the needs and not all the reports we needed at go live. So these were assist the, the remaining challenges that we saw with this. So what are we doing to remedy that? On the financial control side, we, we have allowed an extension of project in dates. So that's how I was kind of starting to allude to before. Um, so while we're waiting on NCEs, amendments and sub awards, so it's basically a project end date is whatever was put in originally, let's say it's May, um, we'll give 90 more days, change the date, which allows all the data to flow through. We didn't start doing that until the fall. So the backlog was created before that, which, you know, which obviously um, that was still a problem, but we tried to, to triage this by making that decision. Um, we've enabled cost transfer to be initiated and approved by department staff, as opposed to being um, hung up in a central place, in a central office waiting for those to be done. So that was also alle alleviating a backlog. For reports, we said we didn't have all the reports we needed, um, particularly ones that were useful to um, uh, PIs. And we've delivered now 15 new reports and over 40 improvement requests since the beginning of the year. We also added one Oracle BI, the business intelligence consultant and two contract developers to accelerate development. We had started with the concept of we were training our people uh, to be these people and we did, but the, the volume of work and the complexity, our people just weren't ready to do this without more professional guidance, if you will. And so the Oracle BI consultant has been extremely helpful in organizing the process and the contract developers, of course, are more hands to get the work done. We've also reallocated two FTEs to support report triage and validation. As far as communications, training and support, we added one full-time trainer to augment our learning options. We've added five temporary resources to improve turnaround time. And we've established a budget and finance user group of frontline staff to vet and prioritize reports and enhancements. And so now I'll turn it over to Kevin. Thank you, Cheryl, um, and thanks uh, everyone for being here. So as Cheryl alluded to, um, the implementation shortfalls um, have been things that we have been working nonstop towards, and we understand that, uh, that it's had a significant impact on the campus, uh, both faculty and staff. So what's coming up next uh, in terms of financial controls, uh, we've gotten feedback from frontline staff that the uh, Oracle system, uh, the way it's configured right now for cost transfer is incredibly cumbersome. And so we've been working with Oracle to enhance that functionality to allow for multiple uh, line items to be transferred with a single transaction. Um, that functionality was actually received uh, over the weekend. Um, the team uh, did our quarterly upgrade and we'll be implementing that functionality with the campus uh, in the April timeframe. Um, we're also going to be uh, streamlining and consolidating security roles. Uh, we got feedback from our uh, academic departments and our fund managers that it's really cumbersome to figure out what roles people should have. Um, while the campus doesn't quite have a, a way of designating and identifying um, specific uh, job functions uh, consistently. Um, we do want to be able to create uh, roles that would encompass uh, all of the security functionality that needs to be uh, granted to a fund manager, for example, versus a department business officer. Um, we uh, have been working with uh, various faculty focus groups, uh, identified, uh, of course, my funds being something that uh, faculty uh, want and expect to see, something very simple and straightforward, um, uh, replicating the old my funds functionality. Um, so that report is in development. Uh, we're, we should be going into testing in the next week. 
uh, or so, and we expect that report to be delivered April 15th. Um, additionally, uh, as part of the ability to drill into a specific project task, um, a new version of the expanded budget with index summary report will also be delivered alongside the my funds replacement. Uh, the idea is that uh, faculty should be able to uh, see all of the projects and tasks within their portfolio all in one place and be able to drill in and see all the transactional details with summary view, um, very similar to the reports that had previously existed. Um, we stood up a, uh, a budget and finance user group, which we'll talk a little bit more later uh, during Q&A. Um, there, there's been some questions around how are we engaging our frontline staff and our department leadership to understand what the needs are. Um, so we are now, um, since January, have a new user group stood up. Uh, and the idea is that that user group will be helping us surface opportunities as well as prioritizing requests that might be coming from departments for new reports or changes to the system. And that work group will be uh, helping us steer all of the uh, enhancement requests coming forward. Uh, additionally, uh, we uh, gotten feedback that the training which pivoted to online was really just inadequate. Um, people uh, would like to have more instructor led training. And so we've created uh, some additional training series um, called the fund management training series which kicked off last week. Uh, the idea is to help to pull together all of the online training material, uh, as well as identify gaps in training materials that we can use to, to bring everything together. So that way folks can sit through more of a curriculum rather than having to figure out what they might need to learn uh, by accessing self-service material. We've been partnering with the Academic Senate uh, and the Operational Strategic Initiatives Office. We'll be launching a survey, an electronic survey that will go out to all faculty and staff in the month of April. And the idea here is to further engage the community uh, to get feedback and then repeat uh, that process after six months so we can measure uh, whether or not we are making improvements and where we might still be lagging behind. We started uh, regular meetings um, several months ago with academic and administrative leadership, as well as frontline staff through both user groups and communities of practice. Uh, the focus is to listen, uh, learn, and address the most pressing system-related issues um, that uh, might uh, be discovered or uh, might be surfaced. So uh, next slide, please. So my funds and the EBS, so to speak, replacements. Um, so what we're doing right now is we're building that functionality directly into the Oracle product. Um, we're gonna make them available starting in April 15th. Links will be available on reports.ucsd.edu, similar to where all of our other reports uh, since go live have been housed. Uh, we would like to provision PIs access automatically, so no one would have to ask for access. Uh, they should be able to be given access. Uh, when you run the report, uh, it will auto run, meaning uh, once you click on it, it will automatically fill out your information so that we know who you are and pull up all of the projects and tasks associated with your portfolio. Now we're going to talk a little bit later about what that requires and uh, what we're hoping our fund managers will be able to help us with, which is to really uh, review these reports, making sure that all of the things that need to show up are showing up correctly, uh, and then uh, work very closely with us on any improvements that we can make. And then uh, additionally, Oracle does have the capability that we can set up email delivery of these reports so that they can be periodically sent uh, without anyone having to go and manually run them. Uh, you'll notice here in the screenshot, which I understand is gonna be a bit more difficult to read, the concept is the columns of budget, expense, uh, you know, uh, commitments, as well as balances will all show up on one screen. We've redacted, uh, of course, uh, to make sure that we're, we're using a real portfolio, uh, but we redacted the project and the task names. So that way it's not showing here on the screen share, um, as well as the name of the PI. Um, but the idea here is everything should show up as individual line items here that would then allow drill through, meaning you click on the task and be able to get to the uh, EBS uh, replacement report. Uh, we'll dig in a little bit more about the setup and how uh, what that would take, um, but let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, and uh, passing this to Karen. Okay, thank you very much. I want to thank everybody today for attending the town hall. Uh, we had over 800 people register and about uh, 100 and 
35 questions were submitted by Friday. And what I wanna say is all of your questions will be answered either today live in the question and answer session um, or in the Q&A box or in a document that will be released after the town hall. And if more questions arise as we're, as we're proceeding, type those in and they will also be answered in one of, uh, one of these ways. And so now what we're gonna do is we're going to go, we're gonna start with um, uh, about five of the, of the most commonly asked uh, questions. And so I should say that many of the questions that I will ask uh, today are compilations of similar questions that were asked by multiple people. And the first, for the first five questions, I think the team has prepared um, slides that cover some of the answers. And then after that, we'll just go into a, a more straight question and answer session. Okay, the first question is, given the many problems that the UCSD community has suffered through as a consequence of the ESR transition, many faculty and staff believe that Oracle is not a good solution for the business system upgrade that UCSD needed. Why was the Oracle platform chosen? How and why were the Oracle platform chosen? Thank you, Karen. I'll take that question. <clears throat> and as you see, we actually did have a, a very competitive bidding process uh, in the selection of Oracle. Um, we had over 3,000 business requirements. We collected those across campus and health through assessment of existing processes and pain points. We did a public solicitation for proposals and there were six respondents, which is pretty much those who would have been capable of, of handling an institution of our size and complexity. The top three vendors there were invited to pilot their software for two weeks each. And we had 60 plus of our end users representing each major VC area attend to these pilots, the various modules within the system, which is why it took two weeks because there are multiple modules here. Um, the, the map on the side basically says, it shows um, the universities that are using Oracle systems. So it is commonly used. We are using Oracle in the cloud, which is a newer version of, of Oracle. So Oracle has been established in the cloud. There are less users, but there are still, we are not the first user, there are other users. Other UC locations are also using um, the same Oracle in the cloud. Merced and the Office of the President have used it. UCLA and Irvine Health are in implementation. Uh, Riverside and Davis are planning. So uh, it has been selected um, by most of our locations. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so the second question is, um, why wasn't the system better tested prior to deployment to make sure that it, that it provided the functions we needed? Uh, why did we have to roll this out in July 2020 instead of, say, July 2021, uh, after its functionality could be more um, thoroughly tested and, you know, reports and things could be completed in training um, as well? So that, that's an excellent question. Again, I'll take this one, Karen. Um, you know, our, our choice was really between, unfortunately, a bad option and a worse one as far as timing. UC Path had already been configured with a new chart of accounts and could not be delayed. The timing of that was controlled by the Office of the President. The payroll system we were on was controlled by the Office of the President. We were the last one, the last campus to still be on that. And they were, they were going to close down that system. They weren't giving us a choice. We could not delay. So we had to do that one and we had to do the chart of accounts at that time. As, as we mentioned earlier that, and as Pierre mentioned and I mentioned that, of course, we were expected to go live in UC Path sooner and have a greater point in time, a uh, greater amount of time between the two than we did. But our options were this, when we got to the time frame that we wound up with, um, go live with what we had ready and continue to improve the system ASAP, or if we delay the go live to July 20. 21. And then we would require the faculty APIs to use indexes in some systems and project and task in others, while having all staff manually report out of and keep two chart of accounts in sync for at least another year. We made the judgment call that that was a riskier situation for the institution than the one we had is the one we chose. As mentioned in my earlier remarks, with what we chose there was some decisions that we could have made that would have improved the situation that we saw um, in, in hindsight. And so for that, you know, we, we had, have learned. But the other option, option two, was really a, a difficult option and not quite palatable. 
So the decision wasn't easy and we recognize that it's been very painful for everyone and certainly feel, um, ab feel about that and doing what we can to try to um, provide support to get us all through this together. Thank you for that. Um, so the next question is why are there still so, so, so many um, significant programming issues, lack of reports and how long before you know, we are able to sort of uh, converge on a, a more user-friendly system? Um, I'll take that one, Karen. Um, so uh, Lynn, if you wouldn't mind going back um, one slide here. So as, uh, as Cheryl um, indicated, uh, a bad option and a worse one. Um, when we went live with the software in July, um, the first, I'd say two months is where a lot of the programming issues were identified, they were reported and uh, we uh, uh, jumped on them right away. Um, after the initial kind of, let's call it programming issues, um, the focus then became um, what have we designed uh, as far as business processes and what uh, did we configure the software to do? And that's when uh, a lot of the adjustments started to happen. Um, we got great feedback from the community that certain things that uh, seemed to function great during testing may not be the most practical. Uh, so some of the things like the financial, the stricter financial controls, uh, as well as some of the reports that were missing that needed to be built became really the primary focus. So for the last several months, um, the goal has been to improve and develop reports that were um, unavailable or were not hitting the mark, as well as changing some of the business processes within the system so that way they can be more user friendly. Uh, the My Funds and the EBS report are examples of that. Um, the stricter financial control were some of the things that were changed. Uh, cost transfer functionality were things that were added. And we are uh, in the process now of making other adjustments so that way we could have uh, a more user-friendly system. I'm going to talk a little bit uh, later on about the chart of accounts because I know there's been a lot of feedback about having indexes be replaced with something completely um, foreign and complicated. Um, that's going to be another one of those adjustments that we'll be making in the system. Um, I would expect uh, many of these adjustments to be made uh, and continue to be made as we listen to the feedback of our faculty as well as our staff um, and, uh, and continue to make those refinements. As far as timing is concerned, um, we believe that with the release of some of these reports, uh, faculty will have a much easier uh, way of getting access to the information. Some of those reports will actually be very helpful for staff as we were hearing some feedback from staff that the EBS report, for example, is something that they use frequently and that it would have been really good to have it at go live. Uh, those are the types of things that we hope will bring more user friendly um, uh, processes uh, to the uh, end users. Okay. Um, let's go ahead. Yeah, and so um, so just to, just to follow up on that a little bit. So there's a you know huge desire by the faculty to have a more user friendly web based portal with similarity mm -hmm. function similar to the my funds. And so um, you think that that's going to be possible uh, and should be available by next month. Can you go to the next slide, please, Lynn? So yes, yeah, so as a, we, we get this question a lot. Um, so right now uh, on reports.ucsc.edu, we have uh, reports that were de developed uh, over the last couple of months. Um, they're currently out there. Um, they're not as user-friendly as my funds, which is the feedback that we got when we demoed uh, the project balances and expenditure details report to our faculty focus group. Uh, and because of that, uh, we believe that actually replicating the my funds functionality uh, as closely as we can, along with the expanded budget with index summary report um, will be key. And so, uh, yes, uh, the goal is to uh, put forth the uh, reports um, that we've been talking about April 15th. Um, all faculty and PI will automatically be provisioned. The reports will be accessible through reports.ucsd.edu. So that way folks will have access. Um, and uh, and the, the really key here is to make sure that as these reports are delivered, um, fund managers um, who are really our experts of the faculty portfolio, um, will really be working closely with them to make sure that all relevant projects and tasks are included. So what I mean by that is uh, we want to make sure that when a faculty member or a lab manager accesses uh, this report, that all of the things that they expect to see that are associated with them, either as a PI, 
as a project manager, as a fund manager, or as a co-I, for example. Well, these are roles that can be associated with these projects. And uh, that would be something that we want to make sure that is set up. Um, so by default, for example, all PIs are listed as project managers on projects for sponsor programs, and those will automatically show up. So there's nothing to do there. But there may be certain instances where a co-investigator wants to keep track of a task that is uh, assigned or that is part of another project that they're not a PI on. So those are the types of things that we're going to want to make sure that we make little adjustments to. Um, we would want fund managers uh, who have been reviewing transactions you know, for those stricter uh, financial controls and take corrective actions as needed so that way the reports are accurately reflecting the expectation of the research program uh, or the, the program itself. And then uh, as part of non-sponsor project tasks, uh, starting in April, uh, we'll be working with fund managers to set up uh, budgets, uh, which is similar to um, some people call it local transactions in financial link. The idea here is to make sure that uh, that all of the non sponsor project projects and tasks are going to show up uh, and calculate automatically the balances. So those are the three uh, critical things that we'll be working with fund managers on um, as soon as these reports are uh, available for review. Uh, we're, we're, of course, going to be getting feedback about ways that we can improve on them uh, and then from there be able to uh, make sure that the reports are accurately reflecting the expectations of the faculty. Okay, and we had a question just in. I think you may have touched on this, but PIs will be able to approve laboratory fund managers to get access. So, um, so these reports are actually going to be um, broadly accessible for uh, users of Oracle. So uh, fund managers automatically will have access. What we're going to be doing is really granting faculty and PI uh, the same level of access. Now, additionally, if there are users of the system that need to get access, we will have an access and approval process that will be published as part of these reports, uh, along with some help content so people can uh, get access to it if they don't automatically have access. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next question. So this question is, I'm puzzled as to how this new FIS system fits into the Lean Six Sigma philosophy, which has been so much at the forefront of UC San Diego's business practices. Moving from a seven digit index to the new opaque chart of accounts has been a main cause of my frustration. This system seems incredibly complex, not intuitive at all. Why are the new chart strings so complex? Why do all the portions of the strings have to be manually entered with no autofill function? It's extremely inefficient and has doubled the time spent on each process. Okay, <laughs> so uh, I, I, I'm a big fan of index and, uh, and we get asked a lot, can we have our old indexes back? Um, so I, I completely agree with everything that, uh, that the, the the, the request or the, the person who asked the question said. So first of all, I think it's really important to, um, to talk about why do we even change this? So I'm gonna gloss over the fact that, um, that every UC campus are in the process of changing their chart of accounts to align with the, the new chart of accounts by 2023. Um, one thing that a lot of people may not be aware of is that our old chart uh, was actually um, very quickly outgrowing its usefulness. Um, we were actually months away from running out of available fund numbers uh, for certain sponsor ranges. Um, we actually ran into this uh, back in uh, 2012, 2011 timeframe, uh, and we were forced to move our fund numbers from numeric to alphanumeric. Um, those of you that have been here for a while probably remember that. Um, we're, we're running out of segment ranges. And so this move out of our legacy chart into a new chart is really, really important. Now, that being said, going from an index to, uh, to a chart string that has 15 or 14 segments is insane, right? And so uh, we've been asked a lot, can we create a shortcut um, just like the old index? And the answer is yes, we absolutely want to uh, become much more efficient than we are today with having people enter in as many uh, chart string segments as they do today. So we're exploring the use of project.task or a project number followed by a task number as a shortcut for the rest of the chart string. So what that will allow folks to do is um, when you're charging to your grant or when you're charging to a project, providing a project and a task for the vast majority of the faculty and PI transactions as well as lab manager transactions will be really our goal. Now, in order to do that, all of the systems that charge expenses will have to be reviewed and some may need to be changed. So for example, uh, the, exam the, uh, the scenario that Karen 
uh, you had uh, put forth with regards to um, having to enter in every single one of those segments uh, in some of the systems is incredibly cumbersome and that uh, shouldn't people be able to just enter projects and tasks um, we're hearing that and so the answer is absolutely uh, we'll be working with a lot of our recharge facilities to start making sure that they're only requesting what they need and not the full charge rate. And then uh, in addition to that, we'll be working on looking at our procurement processes, our travel and expense management processes and concur, uh, as well as any other data entry screen that might be out there. And we'll be uh, digging in to find out, is there any way that we can have those particular transactions focus on just the project and task? Um, and have it sort of defer, uh, basically have it automatically populate all the other segments. Okay. Um, so, uh, the, so the next question is, as of the February ledger, tuition remission back to October has not been charged to grants. People worry about tracking this in their projects. And if awards were to close in the meantime, this could leave people without a funding source. When will tuition remission be posted? Uh, what's, going, what's going on with tuition remission? Uh, lots of questions on this one. Um, the first uh, thing I, I wanted to address is why hasn't it posted since summer of last year? Um, so the tuition remission process um, is a process that sits in between our old payroll system, PPS, and uh, our old financial system, IFIS. Um, with the multiple changes since the go live of UCPATH in May, um, we basically uh, had to redesign that entire process for how expenses are calculated and charged. Um, the process went from a fully automated process to something that was incredibly manual, and it turned out to be a lot more complicated with the way that the data is structured in UC Path and in the new chart of accounts, um, and became very labor intensive. And so uh, for the tuition remission charges, um, it's been delayed. Uh, no question about it. We've been working very closely with our uh, graduate division financial office to uh, see if there's anything we can do to help support uh, automation, help support reports, as well as help support the posting process. And in discussing with our graduate division, they're targeting tuition remission charges for this fiscal year, um, is expected to catch up and then begin posting monthly starting in the March accounting period. Now we're a couple of weeks away from the end of the March accounting period and we're in testing now. Um, right now, all of those expenses are being reviewed with select departments that is helping with testing. Um, our hope is that if everything goes smoothly, uh, we will be able to post all of the backlog change, all of the backlog expenses going back to the beginning of the fiscal year, this accounting period. And then starting next month, we'll then be posting the uh, tuition remission charges on a month by month basis as part of payroll, uh, payroll posting. The detail analysis and review of charges. So this goes back to what Cheryl uh, mentioned earlier about running two different chart of accounts. Um, in May and June of 2020, we were live with, with UC Path on the new chart, but we were still on IFAS. All of those transactions are going to have to be reviewed and, uh, and we're gonna have to make sure that all of those transactions are, uh, are properly analyzed and uh, any adjustments that need to be made are made for uh, the April accounting period. So there will be a delay for the charges from May and June, um, but the rest of the expenses on the new chart will start posting uh, in the March accounting period. Okay. And so this next question I think is, 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 about, is about messaging and I think it's a really important one. So the question is, even though fund managers have been working nights and weekends during the pandemic to support the faculty, the message seems to be that leadership perceives our problems as just user acceptance issues or change management challenges, when in fact, the system has flat out not worked. Can, what can be done to change this messaging? So Karen, I'm, I'm happy to, to take this one. And uh, I would say this is, um, this is not my impression of fund managers. I mean, for me, they are, they are the front line of research the same way um, uh, uh, frontline staff has been through the pandemic. So I have a ton of respect, empathy, and appreciation for them. I thought um, I kind of drove that message in, in my communication, but I will certainly review um, any communication to make sure that the tone is right. We are, we are here to support them, not the other way around. So um, um, I, I appreciate your feedback. Okay. 
Um, there, the next question is, uh, there are many disgruntled PIs unable to obtain the information they were used to getting, and some are taking their frustrations out on staff. Can something more be done to support and protect the staff? So we are aware of that uh, as well. And um, um, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a big deal for me. Um, and uh, I appreciate that uh, everybody is also exhausted after a year of pandemic and, and dealing with this issue. So um, I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus. I, I, I know why, why the, the emotions can be running high. Um, what we're trying to do to protect the staff is two things. One is kind of the right messaging from the top. Um, whether it's through these communications or through uh, the staff town halls and, and uh, kind of any, any way we can, even the chancellor communication. And two is that every time we are aware that um, there is tension in a particular area, we intervene. Um, uh, so people come to us um, and we try to do two things, uh, uh, put additional resources, help the PI, help the fund manager um, and uh, have conversations to diffuse the situation and, and take the blame off uh, of the fund manager. So um, if anybody is aware or is struggling or, or there are particular issues in the department, you know where to find us and, and we'll be there for you. And we handle the situation very sensitively. Okay, and sort of following on this, um, we're told by staff leaders and that staff comments, suggestions and complaints are not taken seriously. And instead staff are told that training and experience will alleviate most of the problems. How can implementation process be structured in a more recursive fashion to include recurring ongoing consultations with staff who have their boots on the ground? I mean, I, maybe Kevin, I, I'll let you respond, but I can tell you that um, uh, we have a change network um, uh, who is there to um, try to deal with as many issues as they can and escalate whatever um, uh, is not working to us. Um, and every time we have uh, we have been um, uh, we have been uh, uh, reached out by um, by local teams, uh, uh, our team, including Sharon or Kevin, have been completely immersed very deeply into the situations, working with many of you on the on the Zoom call directly, kind of one on one. So I think there is a pretty good sense of what's going on. Uh, Kevin, do you want to kind of say more about this? Yeah, um, uh, Vince, you want to go? No, just um, I just want to state we've had we're continuing to call and meet regularly with all of the staff at the at the especially anyone who's having any immediate issues. So Kevin, I don't know how many different sessions we've had, but we're going to continue to do that as we go through the implementation. Uh, so we're staying as as close as to staff as we possibly can right now. So Kevin. Yeah, and so um, so in January of this year, um, we launched a new user group called the Budget and Finance User Group. Um, the goal of this user group really is to pull together frontline and departmental uh, leadership from across all of our major VC areas. Um, the group is intended to really be the ones to surface what are the biggest pain points, uh, as well as prioritizing requests that have been collected from the rest of the campus community. And so um, the, the comment that complaints, suggestions, and, and comments are, are not being taken seriously um, that's a big problem because uh, we need to make sure that we're focusing our efforts on the things that will make the most positive difference. And so if there are uh, any aspects of uh, the feedback loop that is being ignored or that is being uh, disregarded, um, I would really encourage folks to reach out to me, reach out to anyone on the leadership team, uh, anybody here uh, on the panel, because we definitely do not want, especially great ideas, right, uh, to not be taken seriously and acted upon. Um, the, you know, the index one, for example, that I talked about earlier, that's, that's huge, right? And we hear about it and we need to act on it. Uh, so if there are ideas that are being uh, disregarded, that would, of course, counter, be, be counter uh, intuitive to anything that we're doing in terms of engaging. Yeah, maybe one, one idea here might be that instead of just responding to things, maybe something, maybe generation of a more proactive network. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, um, maybe more communication so that people would know who do they go to with their complaints, how to access this network and make sure that the, 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 the I mean, maybe more thought needs to be put into that to be able to get their, those comments and feedback to you in, 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 a, in a more. Yeah, 
Karen, that's, that's a really great, great uh, follow-up. Um, so we, as part of the implementation, had established a change network that was really intended to be that push and pull. Um, since we've gone live, we've been transitioning to this new business and uh, budget and financial user group. So one of the things that we will do uh, as part of publishing the presentation content is I will actually include um, a, a roster of every single uh, participating member of that user group, as well as how to get uh, in touch with them. We will also uh, be pushing out more proactively um, to the network, as well as to the entire financial community, who their uh, representative is. Because I, I do agree with you completely, you know, if there's a name I can call, um, that person could probably tell me, right, like, hey, we've heard about this, we're working on it, or, oh, that's a great idea, let's go and advocate for it. Um, those are the types of things that we really want uh, this user group to do for us. Okay. Um, so a next, the next question is, what can or is being done to identify the, system, the aspects of the system that do not work and fix them? It's sort of along the lines of what we've just been discussing. Yeah, it's sort of along the lines of what we talked about. Um, but but you know, I, I don't want this uh, this user group to be the end all be all either. And so, uh, as Vince alluded to, uh, we have also uh, been fielding individual inquiries from PI as well as from fund managers. Um, we're going to continue to do that. Um, so the user group launching in January is not a replacement for everything. Um, we have a uh, an online community of practice with several hundred people that participate in sharing ideas as well as is providing feedback. Um, we definitely uh, want to continue to leverage that. We have a lot of communities of practice in different VC areas that do surface feedback to the central team. And then I think this user group, as well as our uh, financial systems governance committee, which we will also share the, the representatives and the names of, um, are also additional mechanisms. As I said earlier, um, the, the key is to talk to the right people, right? And, uh, and the last thing we would want is to spin our wheels working on anything that is not going to make a good, uh, make a big difference or make a positive difference to the community. And so all of these things uh, should, be, should be fully leveraged. Okay. All right, so the next one is, um, you know, uh, transitioning more to addressing to understanding what the impacts of this have been. So the question is, have we done or if not, could we do a rough accounting of the impact that the ESR transition has had on PIs? For example, how many PIs have missed a critical re grant reporting deadline? How many PIs um, that have been have been forced to forfeit their remaining balance or found themselves in overdraft? And how many PIs have not hired, um, you know, back staff for the fear of running into the red. I was on mute, sorry. Um, let me you know, let's start in response to that, that in the, the high level, um, we've done an analysis um, comparing overspend and underspend um, year over year. And in that realm that we are similar to where we were last year, but there's a lot more drill down that needs to be happening um, to get to the very specific issues that we, um, with my health sciences hat on, that we are um, engaging with chairs at a fairly detailed level to understand the issues. We're also looking at how we um, as an institution might be able to better support these um, concerns both financially um, as well as providing um, uh, communication with sponsors to help maybe alleviate some of the, the concerns or risks by explaining you know, our system changes and the impacts and why things may be delayed. So at this point, you know, we're still looking on an ad hoc basis um, as far as very specific ones, but the overarching look is not that dire, that does not mean that individuals aren't at, aren't at certain risk. We've also continued to encourage um, administrators to let us know where they see timeline deadline challenges approaching. And we do have uh, teams of people central that are additional folks that we have that will come to your department, come to your fund manager and work with you to make sure that the deadlines are met um, and that the, the funding, the, situ the financial situation is understood. So please feel free to reach out or have your administrator reach out to us where you feel or you know that you have pending deadlines or complex situations with sponsors for which you're particularly concerned and we will get a team in there 
to support what you need to get to hopefully have it come out right and to get what to get what you need. So, you know, please take advantage of that um, that uh, process. Okay, I think this question overlaps slightly with that, but the idea, the faculty are responsible for financial reporting to sponsors and can be prosecuted, which makes them very uncomfortable when their issues are the result of the new system's implementation. Is there, and I think you mentioned that there is then, uh, an institutional response or discussion with sponsors. And the second part of this question is when can PIs expect to be in a position to provide timely certified reports to uh, their funding agencies? So yes, we have we have created some somewhat standard language to use with a sponsor regarding the situation that our faculty are finding themselves in with the new system implementations and the impact that may have on the timeliness and accuracy of the information. And we have utilized that in, in submissions uh, where requested that is coordinated out of OPAS, the Office of Post Award Financial Services for those who need that or want that. And we are happy to do that as well as those folks can assist with the agency um, program manager directly if, if needed as far as engaging in a conversation or a meeting above and beyond the, the written documentation that we uh, are willing to share. The, um, as far as, as timing, I believe um, when Kevin was talking about where we were going with additional reporting, you know, all of that reporting gives you more confidence as to where you stand. So we are doing everything we can to target that we realize that for uh, grants and contracts, it's not a fiscal year issue. It's the timelines vary depending upon the grant time. So it's not just a matter of, oh, it'll be all okay by fiscal year end. We have many people working very hard to get these reports, to get the financial information and to try to make sure that we are in a place that you should feel comfortable in a couple of months. We do have certain things that happen that sometimes are out of our control that may cause you know, delays as we get into things. I think somebody has asked a question um, in the Q&A about a deadline that uh, was a bit, it seemed outrageous as far as direct retros. Many of you know what I'm talking about. But that deadline was changed uh, or moved up earlier by um, the PATH Center without our knowledge. So people had to work through the weekend to meet um, a deadline that was supposed to be at the end of today, which was made at 6 a.m. today. And in order to get these retros in so that your financials will be correct, they had to work this crazy schedule. Now, the PATH Center did not tell us about this communication change. We accidentally found it. Uh, this deadline change. So I only bring that up because that's an example of some of the challenges that your folks will be facing or up against. We, we have made a complaint on that, but that one we can't, we can't change. But everything that's in our control, we are working hard to resolve. And those things like, like the, the payroll information that is not controlled by us, we are using everything we can to our advantage to try to either force the hand of, of OP or workarounds, create workarounds, which we have been doing to try to get through this for you. Okay, uh, so the next question is, the job of a fund manager was already difficult, but with the new systems, they have been delegated many more tasks and have to deal with new issues that never used to be part of their role. And then a number of issues are delineated. Um, what are the plans to reduce uh, fund manager workload to a more manageable level, incorporate feedback from fund managers when providing, uh, when making adjustments to how the system works and to provide appropriate practical training that takes into account what they actually experience on the ground and need to perform their job? Okay, I'll, I'll take that. I'll take the last part of that first related to training just because we have developed um, fund manager training, particularly related to the tools that we have now. And that just started, those webinars just started on the 15th of March. And I understand it's about a, um, a nine webinar series, I think, something like that. But that is to, that was designed, you know, with frontline people's input and all, as well as central people to help the, the um, fund managers through 
the issues they see with this. We're also separately setting up or working on with extension to develop a broader fund manager training program, which will hopefully assist and help with getting new fund managers started and enhancing um, and in the skills of existing fund managers in the overall aspects of their job. As to the um, workload, we have this new budget and finance user group, um, and they will be uh, surfacing things, as was mentioned, that we need to fix and prioritize. So to make sure that we don't have or reduce those things that may be falling upon fund managers now that can and should be automated in a way that it does not burden them as much. Okay. Uh, and what about uh, the fact that the fund manager job now seems to be more difficult? Um, is there any, uh, when they're working it within the new system, are there any plans to reduce fund manager workload? Well, basically, I, you know, my thought or what I was, I guess, I'm sorry if I didn't clarify that before, but with the, um, with a review from the budget and finance group of, of um, user group, where we can make changes in what they need to do or improve or automate things that they're now find themselves spending a lot of time doing, we will do that. Where there needs to be a different synergy between fund managers and those in the central offices, say for example, in OPAFs, where OPAFs can, like I say, do things that are maybe in more in a bulk way or other things like that. We're looking at those kinds of things. And we are hoping as we go through the budget and finance user group, understanding those things which represent um, true, I say true challenges, but challenges associated with a different workflow versus familiarizing with a new way of doing things. We're sorting that out. And as that's sorted out, we'll try to address those things that may create more problems because of the workflow, as opposed to just a lack of familiarity with the system. So we continue to do that. We're also recognizing that certain fund managers are in more complex situations. And we are, we are creating, are looking at how they might be as I suggested kind of with the training, moving through levels of fund manager that some fund managers have a, a different kind of workload than other fund managers. And we're trying to look at ways to acknowledge that with titling, et cetera, uh, going forward. So, so stay tuned on that. I don't know if Kevin, did you have anything you wanted to say? You look like you wanted to jump in. Yeah, so one of the things that we have been getting feedback on is, you know, certain transactions are happening in different places uh, between central offices and academic departments. And that has caused either bottlenecks and or disproportionate workload being distributed from area to area. And so one of the things that, um, that we are actively doing is analyzing uh, the feedback and then figuring out if there's ways that we can um, actually change how the transaction is done. So for example, uh, when we first went live, all cost transfers were being done centrally. And that created this massive backlog where departments are waiting weeks, if not months, for service requests to be uh, processed. And so uh, examples such as that, um, as well as ones where perhaps the transaction went to the department and really should be handled centrally, are the things that we are going to be actively looking for feedback on because we can change the software to behave differently if there are ways in which we can more appropriately distribute some of that workload. So, um, so Karen, going back to your point about the, the types of um, uh, increases in uh, certain fund manager job responsibilities, um, those are definitely the things that we want to continue to evaluate. And then as far as more efficient tools and reducing any manual workload, those are the types of things that we can do to help improve and reduce the amount of work effort that might be required to perform the job. Okay, let's transition to the next question. Do we know how many fund managers have quit UCSD during the last 12 months and how many positions are still unfilled right now? I'm, I'm happy to take that one because I've been paying a lot of attention to this. Um, um, because clear, clearly when you have fund manager vacancies, all the issues get compounded in, in a big way. So um, interestingly, uh, um, fund management uh, turnover has not increased as much as you would have thought or that I would have thought. Uh, uh, the historical number was 9%, and I think in the past year, we uh, increased to 12. 
uh, per cent. But the issue is kind of twofold. One, um, hiring has been uh, incredibly difficult as well because it's a very competitive market right now. People can work uh, remotely. Um, we have lost a couple of staff working for the universities outside of the, the county. Um, and uh, uh, two, um, when there is so much going on, I think historical knowledge is key uh, and, uh, and any turnover is highly, highly disruptive. So uh, there is a lot that we are doing um, to help uh, working both on the retention side and on the, and, and by the way, because um, you're asking the, um, the highest number of vacancy, um, we picked at 38, um, I believe a, a couple of months ago, um, uh, across the entire campus. So it's, it, it's out of a family of about 300 positions. Um, so it's, it's, it was pretty high, and I think 20, 23 of them were in health sciences, if I remember right. So, so it's, it's a big issue. Uh, it has been on, on, on my radar, certainly. Um, we have worked with both uh, health HR and campus HR, and uh, we are responding both on the retention side and the hiring side. So on the retention side, um, what we really want to do is create more uh, career options for our fund managers, and Charles touched on that. So kind of creating a lead and, and senior positions to reflect the complexity and, and the, uh, the role of coaching that some of, uh, some of them are playing. Um, I think we'll open further career opportunities and progression options within UC San Diego. Um, I'm approving um, kind of uh, any equity that the HR teams uh, deem um, appropriate. And on the hiring side, a um, uh, couple of levers there. We're using a search team uh, for the most uh, uh, senior positions. So it's not just passively posting and waiting for the best. We are aggressively kind of recruiting. Um, and then we, we will use kind of TS and training for the more uh, junior position as well to have kind of entry level uh, positions. And Charles mentioned the uh, partnership with the extension school and training. So we are really throwing a lot of levers uh, at this Karen. And uh, it's something frankly, in hindsight, um, um, we should have paid more attention two or three years ago, uh, but it's better uh, later than, than ever, and we are very, very much on top of that. Okay, um, and uh, so an another question is, what can be done to address the issue of staff burnout and help people feel confident and successful in their positions? It's a really hard one, because uh, I think it's a question, frankly, that goes beyond uh, ESR uh, between COVID and uh, remote uh, learning and, and uh, everything that's been, been, been going on across multiple areas. People are just stressed and, and tired and exhausted. So um, uh, it, it's a combination of things. It's uh, uh, a lot of work by our HR teams in terms of putting programs in place and supporting the staff and um, in the most challenging uh, cases using FSAP and, and we're trying to even augment our services there. Um, and then whenever we are made aware of particular issues in the department, um, whether they're linked to ESR or not, um, I can tell you, we just, we just get involved and we, we, we try to help to the best we can. So it, it's not the perfect solution because it's a super hard question. Um, uh, but, uh, but if anybody on the call uh, on the Zoom has suggestions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat as well. Okay, um, so um, this, this question addresses the backlog. Uh, we need more people to address the increased workload and backlog. Is there a strategy to achieve this without becoming administratively overburdened moving forward after this backlog has been cleared? Hmm. Well, I, so I can one jump point in on. that. I'm sorry. Sure. So no, I, I was going to just jump in quickly. So I, I know that with the uh, backlog, um, particularly as it relates to some of the uh, cost transfer, salary and non-salary cost transfers that are being uh, required because of the stricter financial control. Different VC areas um, have uh, determined that they want to sort of um, uh, create uh, different mechanisms to help. Um, so, uh, so we've been working with different VC areas on how temporary resources may be brought forth to help assist with the temporary increase in workload, specifically to work through some of the backlog. Um, we are aware of, um, of ways in which we can make it sort of more streamlined on a moving forward basis. Um, so it's, it's kind of a both and. Uh, we have to focus on temporary resourcing for the, the, the short period of time or the duration in which we have this uh, need. And then on a moving forward basis, how do we make it so that it's not administratively uh, cumbersome 
and that we don't need um, you know, to keep all of our temporary resources in perpetuity because the workload is not coming down. Um, so those are kind of two different areas that we're really focusing on from a system and process perspective, as well as the tools and reports that are being developed. Sorry, Cheryl, go ahead. That's okay. The thing I was going to point out that, um, and this is kind of with my health science finance officer hat on, that among the concerns that were expressed in one of the many forums that we have with, with um, faculty and administrators uh, was this workload for fund managers in the sense of they have like their day jobs, um, which were already challenging, and then this additional burden. So one of the things that we were in the process of doing is pulling together a group of people, some who may be RTAD, others who may be OPEST people willing to you know, work a little more time to assist fund managers with their regular work, their, their pre-award stuff and things like that so that they can focus on this cleanup work. And we're in the process of organizing that and getting it deployed. That may be a, a, a something that would be of value to fund managers. That is the fund manager, the current fund managers are the best able to do that cleanup work because they know where things belong. But there are other things that people who know a little bit about pre-award and about grants and contracts could help with to alleviate some of that workload and so they can refocus. So we're looking at how we can deploy that fairly soon um, amongst departments, that sort of thing. So that's another um, opportunity to help ease the burden that exists right now. Okay. Another uh, question uh, related to this is a, a bonus payment to staff seems a fair way to pay for the extra hours that staff have worked and help prevent further personnel losses. Moving forward, it might also be a mechanism that could provide well positioned and trained people to address the backlog. Could a mechanism be introduced to allow overtime payments for staff to enable them to assist in addressing ESR problems. I, I can take this one because it's a heavy kind of HR question. So a couple of things um, for overtime. Um, uh, if you're um, kind of hourly, you're eligible for overtime. If you're not, you're not. Um, so there is no compensation mechanism for um, kind of policy covered employees uh, um, uh, other than the STAR program. And uh, uh, as you know, you see why the, the STAR program was suspended this year. Um, uh, the focus was on protecting jobs um, and uh, uh, funding uh, some of the policy covered um, kind of increases. So there is no Star Wars. We're not allowed to do Star Wars this year. Um, um, I'm a big fan of reintroducing re the program in the next uh, fiscal year. Again, that's that subjects to uh, the subject to OP's approval. Um, uh, I want to have at least either the merit or, or star, if not both, uh, next year, um, and that's what we're going to kind of uh, push for. So, so the answer will have to be star, but it will have to be next year. Um, uh, again, in the meantime, um, uh, when there are equity issues, we we are addressing them, and, uh, and kind of that that's the way to do it. But uh, we unfortunately cannot um, do Star Wars, and we we don't have any uh, allowable. Um, kind of bonus program uh, in the UC system that we could use. Okay, um, let me see here. So the the question, one of the next question is the current benchmarks for fund managers are impossible to meet in the new environment and foreseeable future. Will benchmarks be adjusted for fund managers? So, um, so I, I, I... I can't speak to all the different benchmarks that are out in the various uh, VC areas, um, but what I what I do know is that um, we are identifying um, transactions that are really um, really causing a tremendous uh, workload issue uh, when it comes to fund managers, and those are the ones that we're really focusing on in terms of improving. Some of them are, as Cheryl mentioned, outside of our control because it's been subsumed by UC Path. Um, we know that uh, salary cost transfers has been the bane of many of our existence and it's, it's underperforming and it's problematic and we've been pushing really hard on, on that end of it. Uh, for the things that are within our control, um, we're pushing Oracle. 
uh, our vendor to provide enhancements to their product to help alleviate some of that. As far as the actual benchmarking is concerned within the academic units, uh, I think it would be really, um, really helpful uh, to look at some of those and see if there are any variances or if there are any way that we can adjust them. Um, I think that would probably be a, a partnership uh, with the VC areas to find out um, what we can do to help uh, both address the workload issue, um, as well as um, revisiting the benchmarks where appropriate. Um, and uh, uh, Cheryl, I don't know if, uh, if you're familiar with all the various benchmarking that happens out in the different academic VC areas. Yeah, unfortunately, I am not because if that was going to be, you know, uh, I'm not sure who sets those benchmarks. But if somebody wants to type that in or whatever, um, we can work with whoever does that to, to look at what adjustments we might suggest to happen. I'm happy to advocate for uh, reviewing those, um, but I'll need to know who has set those. Okay, and since we need to close, yeah, maybe we can, uh, that can be something that we can investigate going forward. Mm -hmm. um, but for the last question then, uh, I, uh, I'll ask this one. What, what will fiscal close look like this year? Will there be special training? Will there be more time than we've had in the past? We are invest from what I understand, we are investigating that now that we are looking for where there's wiggle room and we have found some opportunity for that. We also are in, in, in contact with the office of the president to see what, um, what we can get as far as any time grace uh, on them. So we are actively pursuing that, including the related training. That will be a, a stay tuned. I think we'll have more to, uh, to share before too long and we'll make sure that it gets shared appropriately and communicated widely as we find out what we can do. But we are certainly cognizant of that, both for central folks and for um, out, on, out on the campus. You know, it's all new to all of us. And so we are, all are gonna need some grace here. Maybe I'll ask one more final question. Uh, will there be an audit possibly by a committee of stakeholders to investigate the ESR implementation process to examine lessons learned, decision processes, computer, communication transparencies, internal and in external impacts and mitigation strategies? Uh, I'll answer that one and say yes, absolutely. Um, it's the normal practice for any major system implementation anyways. Um, so um, we, the internal audit uh, team of uh, the UC will do that. Um, they're independent. They, they are functionally located in the campus, but they report straight to the regions. And uh, we'll make sure that they uh, interview, um, I mean, part of the audit will be to interview stakeholders and to figure out um, the experience and then uh, give a very candid assessment of uh, what, uh, what we should learn, uh, what went well, what did not go well, um, what, the, what the responsibilities were um, and, uh, and what we should learn from that. So yes, that will be done, um, absolutely. All right, thank you. And I think with that, I'll hand it back to Steve for the, um to close. Yes, thank you everybody for um, attending um, this town hall. Thank you for all your questions. Um, the um, recording of this webinar, the slides and answers to all the questions will be posted on the uh, budget and finance recorded webinars page. will also be linked from the Senate uh, website uh, as well. So thanks again, hang in there everybody. Um, um, and I will now close this town hall. Thank you. Thank you.